Todd would like to thank the following groups and organizations for their support. We couldn't do this without them. The Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, University of Arizona Poetry Center, the U of A English Department, the Journal Arizona Quarterly, which is housed in the English Department, and Chats Press. Big thanks also to many individual patrons and sponsors for their generous donations. If you are interested in joining that wonderful group of people, please visit our website at hogartstucson.org. Mm -hmm. It's a little bright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys should. That's good. That's good. Try it. That's good. I love um, we have a reading coming up on December 11th. Uh, Charles Borkis, performance artist Tracy Morris, and that'll be an in-person reading also at the Steinfeld Warehouse. So 6 p.m. December 11th. Uh, might be a good time to silence your phones. That was a good idea. Um, let's see. We just began a Sabino Poets Group, another writing in place project. We had our inaugural gathering yesterday. There were four of us. It was wonderful. It's gorgeous fall colors out there. So the hope is to get together um, once a month, um, do a little writing, share a little writing, be inspired, and be in that place together. Um, so I'm kind of the driving force behind this POG project, so talk to me if you want to get on the email list for that, and we'll keep you in the loop and maybe see a few more people down there. Um, speaking of land, we wish to acknowledge that being based in Tucson in the Sonoran Desert, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Tahana Atam peoples and Yaqui, Pascua Yaqui nations. In consideration of the history of violence and dispossession, we encourage folks to reflect on how we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I understand that the origin stories of the Atham mention their ancestors emerging in this area to be stewards of the land. So that's something a lot of us could probably you know, find a way to support and have been finding ways to support. As a poetry group, we can continue to bring voices from Arizona's native nations to a wider audience through pod programming. We've been doing that, we'll continue to do that. Um, POG is committed to being an inclusive, supportive, and safe space for everyone. So if anything happens here tonight that's making you uncomfortable, please reach out to one of the board members and you'll see who we are. Right. There's a bathroom back in the corner. What else do I need to tell you? After our reading tonight, there'll be a brief informal Q&A with readers, so I hope you'll be able to stay for that. And I will now turn it over to Charles Alexander to introduce Tony Luber. Storms are and how 
they hit in amazing times and sometimes with amazing terror. This, though, while I know it's true, is not what Toby, Tony Lieberman is to me. Uh, what he is to me, and has been for uh, all of the 38 years since I first moved to Tucson, is one of the most devoted, maybe the most devoted, and devoted to a broad-ranging kind of poetry, devoted to introducing it to others, devoted to working on boards of directors and volunteering in other ways. Uh, I know he's been uh, so active over the years at the UA Poetry Center. He's been on the Chax Press Board of Directors and the POG Board of Directors, and I think also the Tucson Poetry Festival. You know, that's like poetry history in <laughs> Tucson for uh, my 38 years, but for him longer than that, I believe. And it was something, I think, more than a pleasure to find out that you know, he was going to go and get one of those MFA degrees in poetry, and we're seeing the results in his first two books, and I think they're, they're pretty amazing. And of course, for, for those of us who have known him throughout that time, we would have had no doubt that the level of both intensity and humanity in his work was going to be pretty stunning. So I'm looking forward to hearing him. Uh, I haven't heard him read anything in years, I think, and I'm very glad to hear him tonight. Please welcome Tony Wilson. Thank you, Charles. Can you hear me? Okay. I, uh, uh, most of you have missed the big, the big excitement of my reading tonight, which is when I did a complete crack ball uh, coming into this space. And uh, it was pretty exciting, but uh, uh, maybe sore tomorrow, but I'm fine right now. So, um, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Charles and Cynthia for organizing this. Tim, of course, for donating his space. It's terrific. Thank you, and uh, uh, but especially all of you all of you come. I, I'll read this um, from my three doors, one room. The three doors are uh, human, human, the human door, the natural door, and then the third door is the exit that we all face. So uh, there's uh, uh, two poems on uh, first words and two poems on last words, and I'll read those also. light on the page here. All right. can, can I help you, Tony? I, I can make this a better light. Oh, OK. That's great. Like this. Oh, that uh, does that yeah, that's, it yeah, that's better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Darwin's Islands. He is bent over the scatter, looking for pattern, peering through the jeweler's loop of his collecting, his journals, his mind. Their lenses stacked on his forehead like small saucers. Observation always, finches and wrens, then mockingbirds. Facts and more facts, keys to synthesis, farsightedness, beaks, barks, tooth and feather, islands, the islands' quick difference one after another, codicone negatives, a slideshow, time, a loaf of sliced bread. And there, right at his feet and layer upon revealing layer, the ladders of dark shadow, their rungs of luminous debris, the stiff puddles of sea lion cups, stink of carcasses, grinning skulls, bones of the dead before birth, thin bookmarks. Blind beyond bending. My eyes understand how a great blue climbs from rivers tall grass, slowly lifting wide wings, slowly walking the air over trees into sky, wingstep words, whispering, hush, 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 and then unseen, 
hummingbirds seizing of air and a blurring buzz of many step words. Hanging just there in leafy vines, bright orange flower. And dragonflies, flat zigzag, water hovering, wing words, green glinting, also unseen, maybe droning shadows. And when light, and when a light on twig or lily pad, the water trembles, for the eye counts four, count them again, four wings, only archangels have more. In this sunlit afternoon, all steps disappear, become soundless, unfound, and if found, unsure. For the eye needs time to bend, and more time to bind, and for each thing time bent, there are other things seen that will not be found. First door. Between every two pines, there's a door leading to a new way of life, John Murr. Instant by instant, a bee on fire with pollen stumbles from the heat of the morning glory and walks bright air to the next flower, the next fire. In deep swale of late afternoon, thistles grow velvet in thinning light, while yellow, swallowta with yellow swallowtails kindle shadows. Leaning through, meadow, leaning through meadows, evening trees rise to the mouth of night, to the breath of star veils. Against their dark trunks, fireflies press petals of light, and out of night scrim in countless corral, insects sing the bright, beat, brief sweetness of our lives. Some angels in their cities of dust. The angels. Pipe vine, orange tip, cloudless, hair streak, metal mark, frillary, brush foot, checker spot, crescent, and buckeye. Viceroy, admiral, hackberry, emperor, wood nymph, and satyr, monarch, and queen. Two tail, swallow tail, skipper, long tail, cloud giving, skippery. The cities. Verbena, Lantana, Salva, and Mint, Sweet Bush, Rabbit Bush, Buckeye, Sweet Willow, Mustard, and Pea. Mm -hmm. How Raven Writes Poems. Consider dinosaur at the mossy spring, the massive shape, the wide space feet, shuffling slowly among the stuttering ferns. Its words are movements, step placed, then underline the long, by the long, heavy tail, leaving pool words, phrases of bent bracket. When, sponge, when spongy soil turns to bound loam, a quarried slab is dinosaur's sparse poem. Now consider the raven's dark, bent wing, purple, glossy, burnished by rushing air and light, a shining cloud turning space and time, rolling wind into great waves, each row, feather formed, foams a parched white shore, line after surging line, impossible shells, placed there as glittering words, epic words, each set there by a whirling quill. Trees and stones deep speaking. With water, a stone may sigh, for the language of stones is naked, skin written, rough or smooth, spoken without the means a tree has with leaves, and so articulates instead by bent water, bubbling and gurgle for conversation, ripple and eddy for soft laughter, by waterfall pride, and by glittering deep run pools exuberance. Then there is anger by flood. In quiet moments, stones speak by held light. Hold one in your hand, feel the warm eloquence, the language of trees is murmurings, a rustling rise and fall of words written in leaf for gleaming needles, spoken green by the wind as polysyllabic simultaneous passages, where entire histories are discussed in a single puff. The talk of all our centuries can pass an afternoon among the nodding branches of a tree. And when still in gold autumn light, their voice is more than radiant. Touch a leaf, see brilliance pain countless tinctures in each leaf's verse. 
With language comes silence. Air wheels, smoke, birds fall, fish pop, belly white against a smutty stone. Winter parses, words, snow-weeded, slow. We hold as our pieties, our language for such states, our disjunct grammars for water, air, fire, ice. We have no cognates, no verbs to join, but the babbling separation is ours, ours alone, for deep kernels, ripe kernels, fresh in the shouting word fill rain, when each tree, each stone, with each bright tear, spark and rejoin. Second door. The beauty of the universe consists not only of unity and variety, but also of variety and unity, Umberto Eco. I interpret that to mean, translate that to mean, no holds barred. <laughs> the thimble thief. Once she started, she could not stop. She found them left on shop counters, sometimes behind bric-a-brac, once in the corner of a brown tile floor, and once in the pocket of a greatcoat hanging on the back of the door. She took one that sat next to a bottle of scotch and found another in the morning on a frosted windowsill, and lying by a silver, silver candlestick was another lined with soot. It blackened the back of the nose. Then one fell out of the horse's ass. It smelled like wind and rain, and one loosely wrapped in cellophane that cricked and creaked on opening. And that same night, she found another made of grass stuck in the heavy bark of an oak, and while washing it her hands just before bed, one appeared in a bar of lavender soap. Then she saw one made of gold, floating in air, held there, she supposed, by God's request, so she reached for it. Oh. <laughs> Intersection song. Next to black smears on tire-beaten curbs and cracked gutters filled with dead weeds, where muffled thumps of the heavy metal song beat to the thrum of idling cars, where pigeons peck away at a dark feathered mess mashed to the curb like a shaft of miners wielding picks in a scene of black window, in a scene of black windows spewing black air several cars back and a thousand feet down in the cross shaft of someone's claim waiting for the red to turn green. And in this mind of exhausted hearts, a veins empty of all but fumes, with a numbing blur of passing cars, of shopping carts piled with junk-filled bags, and ragged men crossing nowhere streets, we rake for loose rock on the back overhead, against the mountain's granite stair, our god of stone that never smiles, and catch a glow from the traffic device, the shining aura of a caution light, a small yellow bird in a little yellow cage. The plural, the, the plural of die is dice. Ever wonder about random events, like slicing butter over hot rice, a song of notes that slides and melts, or think of the things you wrote in yesterday's journal about your sister's latest style, the way she underlines, dots eyes, a heart, and what she says about her friends, that Carrie's making out with Jim, and Sarah's uncertain of her new beau deal, but there's jobs to be had, and well, so there's Land's End and Chico, Wall Street, Halliburton, then Bass and IBM. The babies come and all gets serious. At Haley's Comet, the beer is warm, an overstuffed chair is used for music. And so, life insurance or not? Perhaps a summer home on Lake Tugogan, a trip to Italy, some rain. You hand a sunrise to your sister. The parents die, inheritance, the house, cars, the yard sale, and in a while, cancer sings at her breast, hums at your testicles and liver. Still, the kids go to college, maybe travel, perhaps get jobs. No suicide yet. The coffins continue to blossom. The telephone rings. You whistle a tune that tastes of sand, pick a feather off the ground, fold a yellow beach towel twice, put it away, listen to a whale on the radio, buy a grave. Both doors open. People don't know how to make a leaf, but they know how to destroy one. Hope Jaffer's lab girl. 
A real man knows how to nurture nature and nurture himself from nature. Marcus L. Kukuska. Desert night magic. Sometimes I stand in moon's shadow, swirls spell brushing my skin, the desert spewing its black perfume, the sky, the air charmed with light, listening to the cast, listening to the cast spells nearby, the bright shrill hawks pute, the oros deep hoo hoo the vowels, the bright thin yips of, of coyote covens, while watching the bats weave stars and trying to twig the magic to learn the incantation, how dawn makes night disappear without pain and marveling with only a wave of twilight's wand, its enchanted return. Mm -hmm. Staking claim. I earned my claim here today by long bushwhack and sweat through rough terrain and hours of look and listen. On the lake, a loon shivers its image, lifts its cry across granite and leaves, Winds rise and brush away, sighing again and again. Mirrored light of a reddening sun tints the trees. Darkness begins to rise. Pine needles drift down to the lake shadow. Fall of a late summer day sharpens the edge of the changing, changing season and my place as a first person here. I rise to go and step to an old pine to pee, to seal the bark wet with my claim. But there the tree before me the rusty head of the nail. On roses at night after dawn, excuse me, on roses at night under stars. With night sounds ticking and stars bright state to black, the fragrance of roses blocked by heavy hedge, waifs from a neighbor's yard, across property lines, fences, zoning, deeds, and covenants. A vitality ignoring restrictions, penetrating through briar, vine, and wood, prevailing over laws, rules, morality, artifact, and judgment, bringing the dark pulse of essential red, vivid, more real in this night than day, bringing scent light woven into dark light. Above the stars are witness trees of space, marking the corners of our myths, our ancient properties, Orion, Cassiopeia, Big Dipper, Pole Star. Shooting beyond us in breathless, cold transits, indifferent to human styles, human forms, brought by time's tireless shuttle, weaving into the night the fire from stars living, stars dead, fabric at once holding both opaque, mysterious, untouchable, chilling the upturned face. Seesaw. I've seen a dying eye, Emily Dickinson. Sitting in a chair with my back to the east window as night comes, the evening newspaper spreads colors of the world across my lap. To the west, the news seems glorious. Suddenly, a solid thump, something dropped, and I look back over my shoulder to see small feathers lit by the setting sun, floating like embers from a kick fire, and shining on the window pane the imprint of a dove in flight, feathers outstretched, each caught in closely luminous dust. Even his beak is there, and the small left eye, a dusty stirper, sat staring into the glass, trying to see what it was it saw. The third door. Death transforms life into a destiny. Simon de Beauvais. Blue. To, comp <clears throat> to comprehend the nectar, to comprehend the nectar requires a sore's knee, Emily Dickinson. There's little to say about dried chicken bones, except that the splinters are hard and sharp, and how these make such a painful connection to the harsh, stretching sound of a dog's struggle as he opens and closes his mouth. And because of blue, I understand better the import of foregrounding clouds, how gray can shape and flatten the infinite and shadow the clearness we hold. And in each of these moments of darkness, despair, there's always the closeness of promise and hope. 
as when I saw in my love's dark eyes that moment of shimmer, the intimate luminous that brushes the heart, the way birds flying dawn will sketch the sky, a completeness that radiates in colors and form for a picture more brilliant than light, all from a kitchen floor of canvas and a brush of red spinner bones. <coughs> Susan and I were on an archaeological dig at the University of Arizona when we first came to Tucson. And we were up there for three summers called Grasshopper, 400 room Pueblo. And from the Pueblo, extracted about 400 burials over the years that the, the site was active. Uh, all those have been returned to, uh, to the earth and to uh, the tribes. But uh, uh, it was pretty amazing. These, uh, uh, life was tough. It was really tough. Anyhow, this is an elegy for the archaeological field school. Grasshopper Pueblo, circa 1300 A.D., Civic U, Arizona. They lived hard, high on the Maguillon Rim, among dark pines. They painted pottery and polychromes of red and white, finely shaped, and planted corn in spring soil, cool after rain. Shells from the salt seas adorned their arms, and from the tropics, bright colored, fe bright colored, bright feathered parrots perched in their homes. Often, mothers young with newborns buried on their chests, their rib bones woven with the babies, a basket of mother and child cloistered in bone song. Often, too, children under ten buried in graves empty of offerings, empty of the Pueblo's grieving, for death close to birth was further from love. Two large potsherds used to scrape a fetus from a dirt floor uncovered in a garbage pit, between the shards, tiny notes of their song, like those from a small bird. Last words. How is it that a dog barks, seems happy about it? That fish sew watery quilts in patterns that glitter, while embroidered above are butterflies, gulls, that sunlight in a waltz called wind, laces leaves so freely. That rain tats notes of grace to clover each blade, each leaf. That waves so smoothly wave over seaweed currents under so much blue. While geese cross stitch the sky with cries so raucous. That ants weep quickly through thick wefts of grass. While we dot our days with bluster slog pathless and stumble on the glorious cloaks of dawn that could and should adorn us. And my last poem is called After Storm. Wind sharp scissors slow my morning walk. At my feet, autumn's leaf, red and so formed it holds rain, fresh from last night's angry talk, a fretted fire, dark felt, thick sound. That storm tore mountain stones, cut trees, and stitched the air, so early morning forms a cold, hard sheath, dulling the light, but lifting the dark. There, amid rough roots, out of the wind, I see, pinned in this leafy cup, a dying moth. His heart wings beat in silent, helpless rings. Black clouds sweep. In the east, a golden cloth unfurls to glorify these small, frail things. From high, the raucous blessing of the weeping geese, a song that shrouds this death, every death, with Earth's belief. Thank you.
It's my real pleasure um, to get to introduce uh, Karen Brennan tonight. And um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the power of literature, um, trying to my best in an essay that I'm writing here to kind of grapple with and try to explain, you know, what is this relationship between poetry and, um, as Karen's, the title of her poetry book puts it so beautifully, The Real Enough World. Um, but there's a real challenge in trying to write out these connections, I think, because there seems to be a real disconnect between the experience of literature and anything that's possible to say about it. When I do think about the experience of literature, what it, connections it can make, what it can open up, what it can do, what comes to mind is not anything I can really explain, but instead the sensation I had the last time I had the pleasure of hearing, hearing Karen read she read from her story collection, Monsters, was at the um, Poetry Center. And when she finished, when the audience began to applaud, I found I really I couldn't move. And if I had opened my mouth, I don't know what sort of sound I would have made. A whisper, a laugh, a sob, a shout, all of the above. So rather than, or in addition to, I think, a series of vivid characters and images, what Karen left me with was an actual physical sensation of the way that all of the basic human emotions, joy, fear, sorrow, rage, are integrally connected. How every story is knit from and connects with every other story. As Paul Lasicki has said of Karen's latest work, television and memoir, which I believe she's going to be reading from tonight, Imagine working in miniature and implying the whole world in each passage. Karen Brennan is that kind of writer. The book, he writes, resonates not like a conventionally structured memoir, but something more intricate and alive, a hive of songs that are at once astringent, tender, comic, and rueful. I think that what this gets at is precisely the sensation I got when listening to Karen read from Monsters a sense that language and literature doesn't just at its best describe the experience of life, it becomes another living body as complex and vulnerable and as entangled as that. So we're very lucky to have Karen with us this evening, the author of multiple poetry, fiction, and nonfiction titles, a recipient of a National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship and an AWP <coughs> award, Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing at the University of Utah. Karen's stories, poems, and essays have been published widely, including in anthologies from Norton, Grey Wolf, Penguin, Small, Best Small Fictions 2017, and Women's Experimental Fiction. Since 1991, she served as core faculty for the Warren Wilson MFA program for writers, but luckily for us, she calls Tucson home. So please join me now in welcoming Karen Brennan. redundant. I've thrown in a few other pieces to alleviate what might be a redundancy. Um, I want to thank also Tim. Tim, wherever you are, thank you. Thank you for the space. This was a godsend. And it's lovely to read here, really. It's just a lovely, comfortable space. And I want to thank Tony, those poems. My, I just really wanted to sit for a while and not get up and read, because I wanted to think about them and bask in them. And I love small, the small birds that kept occurring in those poems. It was really, they were really beautiful. So thank you for that. So I'm going to start. You can all hear me even if I move away from the mic, right? OK. I'm going to start with a, you know, I, I, like many of us, you, I wrote a million 
things during the pandemic. 99.9% um, .9 of them real crap. But, um, you know, a few of them, you know, I kept looking at them and thinking, well, maybe, maybe they're okay. I don't know. I was writing constantly during the pandemic and produced hundreds of poems, and I'm not exaggerating. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read a couple of poems before I get to reading from television. I will read from television. And then I'll read maybe a little very short weird fiction, because I started writing a bunch of really short weird fictions too during the pandemic. So, I mean, this is, I guess, a cautionary tale. <laughs> okay. So maybe some of you will recognize where this is, what, to what I am referring when I read this first poem, which is called, wait for it, Party Time in the 21st Century. I stood next to the wine table, waiting for the rain. A man in a cowboy hat said, there's no moon. People pass by with paper plates of indecipherable food. My own hat was somewhere. I put it down before the dancing, before the waving around of arms, the mad twirling. I felt sorry for everyone. The world was so cruel, the chicken wings way too spicy. I wanted to be elsewhere, riding my bicycle down the river park, birds screaming, or in bed with a good book rain tapping the window. I didn't care about the moon. But here I was stuck at a party. My hat was somewhere, who knows where. The bedroom was full of coats, the living room full of dancers, but I remained in the wine room. The man had turned away. A girl at a communist beret said, excuse me, she wanted Merlot. <laughs> when it rained, I cheered up. On the patio, people were racing for cover. There was a song I liked. People were still dancing. I, too, was dancing. I felt sorry for all of us. How did we wind up here? What brought us together? Dizzy specks in the bright, tumbling space of the universe, waving our arms like mountains. And then I guess I'll read this other one. I, still, I couldn't find poems that I remembered reading, and then I found other poems that I didn't remember writing, so, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's because I'm old, I'm sure. Also because I write a lot. Okay, this is called Candle. And suddenly there was something new that I thought about that occurred to me that came racing into my mind. And my mind made a rectangular space like a door. And inside the door was a dream I hadn't had in years. And the stairway to the dream led me up and up. And then at the top, I was able to look down. Finally, I looked down into the room I left behind, which was this room, with its tables and chairs and walls and windows and framed photographs and the indelible imprints of children, and the honest mirror, and the white candle in the little glass dish with its extinguished flame. OK, now I will read from television, which came out in um, last February, actually. <coughs> I'll read the title. I'm just going to sort of go through it in a sort of order. It's, it's a, um, you know, I call it television a memoir, but it's actually not really a memoir. I mean, it's kind of an ironic memoir, I guess, and some pieces in it are real and some are made up, and who knows what's true anyway in the world. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of read through because e even though I'm claiming it's not a memoir, it does follow a life trajectory, which is the life of me. So I will I will begin with the title with the title piece. And who knows? Is this fiction? Is this nonfiction? Is this poetry? Who knows? I'm not interested in the answer. So, but if you want to give me one, you can. Television. The first television in our neighborhood belonged to the O'Neills, who lived in the big brown house across the street. 
lodged in a shiny console, possibly bakelite, and flanked by a weird assortment of knobs. It reminded me of my doll's oven. That night, our family was among those neighbors who trooped across the street to witness the contraption for the first time. The evening air shifted restlessly, as if marking the end of a more predictable era. Otherwise, the neighborhood was as quiet as it usually was in those days. The houses in deep shadow, except for the yellow halos coming from lamps set upon tables covered with family photographs in silver frames. Nowadays, when you look in the window of houses in the evening, you usually see the blue flickering lights of the TV. But back then, the windows glowed more steadily, and people read books or washed the dishes or darned socks, as my mother actually did in the evenings. We had a Victrola, as it was then called, and sometimes we listened to music, but not very often, since my mother preferred classical. It did not like to burden us with her taste. <laughs> About 15 of us gathered in the front room of the O'Neill's big house, a sort of square hallway beneath the staircase where the TV had been installed on a table. A few chairs were brought around, but most of us stood on the green wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, craning our necks around those in front of us ready for whatever it was. I have no idea what we saw, what black and white image blinked stupidly across the screen, and I was not impressed. I was a self-absorbed child, and the picture was hard to see, not pleasurable, and thus of no concern to me. To everyone else, it had been a shock. I recall my mother shrieking like seeing a chair fly across the room, or a dish of apples suddenly begin to cough. <laughs> Polio. When disease visited our family, casting its brutal shadow, our days became marked by whispers, followed by long, nervous silences as though someone had mentioned the unmentionable and then felt guilty about it. It was infectious. I was ashamed, too. There was a sick brother whisked away in a blue blanket. My mother wore a red, a red jacket, my father a tan raincoat. The baby was invisible beneath the blanket. A tableau, they stood by the front door, the door slightly ajar in the act of leaving in the rain. They stayed there a long time, motionless, posing for my memory of them. Flipping around here. I just realized that, that Tony and I both talk about doors a lot. I just realized I have a lot of doors in these poems. It's a thing, it's a poet thing, I guess, or a writer thing, or a human thing. Okay, this is one that I always say if I read this, everybody's going to hate me, but say la vie. I once had, a, I once had a, a, a writer friend of mine say that the, the thing that one should do is write the hardest thing. So this, this is the hardest thing, I guess, because it's, it's awful. Shame. When I was six, I tortured a girl. We ordered her to stand against a tree in her own backyard while we waved dog shit in front of her face, screaming at her to smell and eat. The girl had a soft, pale face with eyes that were almost transparent. I remember her gazing at us with tears and the horrible thrill that scudded through my body. Along with others, I screamed and waved my own stick with its glob of dog shit. I had not been a popular child, and I suppose the thrill was just as much at being invited to participate with the gang of girls that usually excluded me. The girl who had been our neighbor had light brown hair. Her fingers were red, her fingernails bitten. It's all lodged in memory, the tree with its copper spoon-shaped leaves, the cold smell of the air, the white sky, 
and her name like yesterday, each flaming syllable. consider the ants. Also, I was lonely. I never went anywhere, never met anyone. It was all very white in there, very glary. My mother's voice was like a symphony of violins that lifted me and affirmed my belief in angels. In contrast, my father's voice was a furious explosion tossing me from side to side and hurting my head because my own voice had become tiny and soft. No one, not even the angelic orders, could hear me when I cried out. Very self-pitying poems. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. I had a sad life. School. I went to a convent school, and our teachers were all nuns who wore habits. The habits consisted of black robes and white frilly headdresses, out of which their pale faces would gaze at us with disapproval. Their wire-rimmed spectacles were oddly frightening. I'm not sure why. Their job was to teach us how to be young ladies. Our uniforms, check jumpers with white blouses and Peter Pan collars, were perfectly hideous, I told my mother. Also, we had to wear clunky brown Oxford shoes with navy blue knee socks. <coughs> Even the most beautiful among us looked unattractive in the uniforms, which miraculously erased us, as if we were one body of useless females marooned on an island of useless nuns. Our school was a former estate belonging to a famous industrialist. Situated on a sort of farm, there were cows in the pastures and chickens in the barns. The nuns lived in cloisters, and we lived in little cottages sprinkled around the property. In my memory of that time, the sky was always gray, and the tree branches bare and tangled, a pen and ink drawing, and we girls, sad little scribbles beneath, marching to mass or class or to the concert hut. Our rooms at night were cold and the covers thin. It is as if we were preparing for a life of sacrifice, which, as it turns out, we were. My mother said, be thankful you have anything to wear at all. <laughs> Check my time. Okay. War. This is from the second part of the book, a kind of mid middle of life thing rather than a kid thing. War. And that's the way it was in tone CBS's Walter Cronkite with his big megaphonic voice, his square head bobbing and looming commandingly into our living rooms. Across the street, night after night, the names of the dead, their ranks and serial numbers. Cronkite, NBC's young and handsome Peter Jennings, Huntley Brinkley on Channel 13, and the names of the daily dead. November 17, 1968, was the bloodiest day of the war, 155 killed. In between, there were ads for Brill Cream or Pepsodent, hair and teeth, remnants. We all protested, feeling virtuous. 
When the soldiers came home, we expressed our contempt, we who were privileged and did not serve. LBJ was uncouth and bombastic. His bird-like wife planted blue bonnets all over the Texas highway. I was a mother. I marched and protested. I smoked pot and wore flowers in my hair. Barefoot, I carried my infant daughter into the fray, into the lost light of the world. C'est moi. As a child, I've been the victim of various unkindnesses, no doubt brought on by my own difficult personality, a kind of failure to fit in coupled with disdain for others, even though I had very little self-awareness. To me, the world existed inside of books in the caves of my own imagination, so beautifully fed by books, and eventually, having cultivated the long habit of mind which held those dramas and visions and ethical appeals, I fell naturally into a habit of daydreaming, of insinuating myself into the center of those daydreams in some heroic light or other. Had I only read Madame Bovary, I would have perhaps recoiled from my own vanity and superficiality, but I was too lazy for Flaubert. <laughs> when I finally got around to reading M.B., I was too old to benefit from the lesson of poor Emma having already married the wrong man. <laughs> I feel like I'm reading too long. <laughs> Confused. I'm confused. Okay, this is the last one I'm going to read from this book, and then I'll read a couple of other ones if I have time. Jackpot. As if someone had fed lucky coins into the slot machine, children tumbled out of me in a clatter. Some of them <laughs> flew around my head like shiny demons with red horns, and others sat quietly in trees like Calvino's Baron. They ran races, baked cakes, threw pencils at their teachers, sulked in their rooms, read books, drew pictures of monsters devouring a village and pictures of flowers growing pleasantly around a white house, or they simply scribbled on the walls with purple magic marker and laughed about it. <laughs> they smeared my lipstick over their tiny chapped lips, stumbled around in my high heels, polished off the scalloped edges of an entire Thanksgiving pie, and once, opened their Christmas presents the week before without apologizing. <laughs> they fought each other like vicious animals, eager for the taste of blood, shrieking in the backseat of the car, squirming under the covers, rifling through my clothes with their sticky paws in order to make a tent, always singing, crying, imploring, eating, vomiting, and swearing. <laughs> I was never not alone. They crawled into my ears and infected my dreams. They joined hands and formed a ring around the rosy circle, trapping me in the middle of monkey spinning, trying to get my bearings. They stole my heart by dint of some magic, and then suddenly they vanished, and the air was calm and sweet, and the trees were unfettered, and everything was so, so quiet, I thought I would die. <laughs> Um, a couple of sort of newer pieces. One is a, a kind of, um, I'm, I'm putting together, I think, a book that's a, of mythologies, not to, not to steal anything from dear Roland Barthes, but um, I'll call them mythologies of me or something. But, um, <laughs> But anyway, I'm putting together this book, and I think of this as being one of these two as being part of that book of short, flashy kinds of fictions. This one is called Glyph. The other evening, I met a man in a coffee house. At least I think it was a coffee house, though I was drinking a beer. He wore a green pilled sweater, and he had a square head. 
His features are a blur, even at the time they were blurred and indistinct. They didn't strike me as memorable. What I noted was our conversation in which he interrogated me as if for a future long-term relationship. Every time I gave an answer he liked, he said, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Despite this irritating tick, I was drawn to him. We were obviously simpatico. What is your passion, he asked, and I said, jazz vocals, and he said, correct. <laughs> It was nighttime. The stars were beaming down in a friendly way, and back at the hotel I realized I had lost my key, nor could I remember the floor my room was located on. The desk clerk told me I had to fill out a form in order to be led into my room, and she led me to a little gathering of chairs, and in one of them sat the man from the cafe with his green pilled sweater. He was gazing intensely at a blank page in a book and then writing something down. I don't know if he noticed me at first, but I thought it was an amazing coincidence. I wondered if the pilling indicated that he'd had the sweater for a long time. Are you married, he had asked me before. And I said, maybe. And he said, correct. <laughs> At this point, a dark-haired woman joined us, or maybe it was my friend Paula. Again, my memory is hazy. We were all chatting, and I got up to order another beer. The man behind the counter said, Oof. said, and behind the counter said, how about a glass of wine? And I said, no, I really wanted a beer. When I returned to the table, the man with the pilled sweater got up and left. I remember he'd said something about going to a club, and I remember I said something about being tired. Now back at the hotel, he was writing something on the page of a, on a page of a sketchbook. Perhaps he is a writer, I thought, and this excited me because I thought I could contribute to a conversation about writing. The form the desk clerk gave me to fill out was unnecessarily complex. All this for a key, I asked. How do we know who you are otherwise, said the clerk, who wore something like a white apron. What did I really want, aside from being an excellent jazz vocalist? It seemed to me we were on a lake that I had visited many times. A boy took me water skiing on the same lake when I was an ungainly teenager. If you traverse the wake, everyone applauded, but then the challenge was to get back into the wake again, and that was harder. I had no ambition, athletic or otherwise. Ungainly and somewhat clumsy, I nonetheless managed to cross the wake a few times. The wake was composed of brown, churned up water, and beyond it, the surface of the lake was silvery and smooth. All the houses in the distance, and even the hotel from that long ago time, were tiny and stationary, frozen in time, and in my memory of that time. Finally, I simply let go and everything slowed down. I sunk tenderly into the silvery lake, my skis slowing my descent as if I were being released into a bottomless well. All kinds of disturbances happen at this point. There is no working pen and the desk clerk goes off to find one. In the old days, this hotel lobby was magnificent, everything shiny and quite grand. Chairs covered in satin tapestry, a front desk made of marble behind which the desk clerk stood at attention and wore white uniforms with gold buttons. My friend and I once scratched our tiny initials into a wooden beam in the ladies' lounge, but they disappeared. The man looked up from his notebook and caught my eye. Though I was drawn to him, I still could not recall his face. I felt we belonged together, and yet if he asked me to come to my room, I would have told him no. Was that the correct answer? The speeding boat became smaller and smaller as it went off without me, but the lake is still there, and the stars shining on its surface, and I am there too, sinking slowly into the oblivion of my life, here where I find myself. about reading that one. <laughs> it's a 
is the last one I'll read. This is called Reality. Reality. He was building a miniature city in his room, tiny houses and buildings and people made of thin strips of wire and streets made of ribbons pilfered from the gift dial and someone like him and someone like his manager and a few customers pushing shopping carts made of paper and shards of glass. In a box he found a spool of thread. He unthreaded it and then snipped off tiny segments and knotted them and cut them apart and strewed them into the parking lot. Cars, but not quite enough like cars, he decided. So he scraped them into a palm and decided, no cars for now. For now, the parking lot would be empty, holding the sun's glow on its surface like an ocean. And other very small miniature things like tiny people, those filamented people with beards and top hats from another era, and gowns trimmed in lace. The people would walk on the shady sidewalks beneath miniature skyscrapers. It was a city of splendor from a long time ago and also from our own time. And there was no squalor. He thought this. There was no squalor. So he made some squalor. He made tiny weapons and ferocity and greed and rage. And he bestowed these qualities in the hearts of the people and upon their night tables. This is reality, he thought. Finally, I've captured it. Thank you. <laughs> Talk readings, we try to get the authors to take a couple of questions at the end, which I hope is okay. Um, and if Tony, if you want to come back up here. Sure. Okay, and, and either, usually you know, only about, you know, no more than 10 minutes. So do, would you like to sit on our chairs? Michigan, where we have a family place up there, and uh, surrounded by woods and lakes and, and rivers, and uh, it's a marvelous place to spend the summer. Uh, the winter, forget it. Uh, it's like Buffalo, maybe, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's beautiful in the summer, and there's quite a bit of wildlife there, and uh, a beach on Lake Superior. So that forms a lot of the poems, the, the context of poems here, plus the, the Coming to the desert makes a wonderful contrast and a, a wonderful uh, uh, complement to that those summers. So I guess that in, in there somewhere are birds. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, I feel I feel the desert in your in your poems. I really do. I feel the natural world, you know, sort of humming around us when you read from 
from from this book. So yeah, thank you. lovely, thank you. lovely. I didn't feel the Upper Peninsula, but I don't know that yeah. in the area. <laughs> <laughs> it's there somewhere. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to ask you both since you're writing about a fairly distant past, whether you had to wrestle with a lot of nostalgia. Um, did you allow it? Did you give it some space, or did you rein it in, or was it not an issue at all? <laughs> I sort of don't like nostalgia. I think. I mean, I, I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a. I, I don't know, but maybe I'm wrong on this. But I think it's kind of a. For my poetry, it'd be kind of a weakness uh, to be nostalgic. Um, I, I like to avoid that, you know, as sentimentality of a sort. Uh, so. Yeah, I know what you mean, that it could so, that sort of longing for the past could so easily be sentimental, right? Um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about it that much, really, when I was writing. I didn't, I didn't try to avoid it or try to um, encourage it. Really, I mean, luckily, a lot of my, a lot of the things I wrote about were not very happy memories. So, I mean, some of them some of them were, you know, sort of happy-ish. But um, <laughs> but I didn't I didn't feel like I had to, um, you know, one usually isn't nostalgic for something that has been painful, right? So, I didn't feel like I had to to rein that in at all. Um, anyway. It's my best answer. I don't think that the book is completely about painfulness, but whatever. It seems like both of you are dealing with the truth. You know, observation, um, what you learn from observation and looking back at it, but not in a sentimental way, not in that kind of, you know, ooh, you know. <laughs> I just think. Mm. You know, and Karen, you always save, uh, save us from nostalgia by your wonderful sense of humor. Yeah. And so I never feel it's <laughs> as if you're being nostalgic, but almost being the opposite of nostalgic. Oh, and thank you. Tony, that one image of the little yellow bird in, in its little yellow, little yellow, yellow cage. cage. I love I'll that. never forget it. Thank you. Not nostalgic. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love that image, too. Yeah. I think we've got real problems in the world today. I don't think anybody would deny that. And uh, I hope my poems bring those out, and uh, hopefully people will think more about them. Uh, nostalgic in that sense, maybe. I don't know, is there a nostalgic side of that? Possibly, but uh, certainly uh, what we're doing to the world today is pretty dreadful. And we're spending billions of dollars looking for another world. Mm, uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> heading to Mars. Let's go to Mars. Yeah. So, right. I'd like to say thank you again to, to Tim and to uh, Charles and Cynthia for organizing this. And it's an honor to read with this lady. I admired her for a long time. Vice and, versa. And uh, it's been terrific. So, <laughs>
surprised about reading that one. <laughs> this is the last one I'll read. This is called Reality. Reality. He was building a miniature city in his room, tiny houses and buildings and people made of thin strips of wire and streets made of ribbons pilfered from the gift aisle and someone like him and someone like his manager and a few customers pushing shopping carts made of paper and shards of glass. In a box he found a spool of thread. He unthreaded it and then snipped off tiny segments and knotted them and cut them apart and strewed them into the parking lot. Cars, but not quite enough like cars, he decided. So he scraped them into a palm and decided, no cars for now. For now, the parking lot would be empty, holding the sun's glow on its surface like an ocean. And other very small miniature things like tiny people, those filamented people with beards and top hats from another era, and gowns trimmed in lace. The people would walk on the shady sidewalks beneath miniature skyscrapers. It was a city of splendor from a long time ago and also from our own time. And there was no squalor. He thought this. There was no squalor. So he made some squalor. He made tiny weapons and ferocity and greed and rage. And he bestowed these qualities in the hearts of the people and upon their night tables. This is reality, he thought. Finally, I've captured it. Thank you. <laughs> readings, we try to get the authors to take a couple of questions at the end, which I hope is okay. Uh, and if Tony, if you want to come back up here. Sure. Okay, and, and either, usually only about, you know, no more than 10 minutes. So, do, would you like to sit down in chairs? Michigan, where we have a family place up there, and uh, surrounded by woods and lakes and, and rivers, and uh, it's a marvelous place to spend the summer. Uh, the winter, forget it. Uh, it's like Buffalo, maybe, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's beautiful in the summer, and there's quite a bit of wildlife there, and uh, a beach on Lake Superior. So that forms a lot of the poems, the, the context of poems here. Plus, the, the, the Coming to the desert makes a wonderful contrast and a, a wonderful uh, uh, complement to that those summers. So I guess that in, in there somewhere are birds. You know. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel I feel the desert in your in your poems. 
I really do. I feel the natural world, you know, sort of humming around us when you read from 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 this book. So yeah, thank you, lovely, thank you. lovely. I didn't feel the Upper Peninsula, but I don't know that yeah. area. <laughs> <laughs> It's there somewhere, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes? I wanted to ask you both, since you're writing about a fairly distant past, whether you had to wrestle with a lot of nostalgia, um, did you allow it? Did you give it some space or did you rein it in, or was it not an issue at all? <laughs> <laughs> I sort of don't like nostalgia. I think. I mean, I, I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a. I, I don't know, but maybe I'm wrong on this, but I think it's kind of a. For my poetry, it'd be kind of a weakness uh, to be nostalgic. Um, I, I like to avoid that, you know, as sentimentality of a sort. Um, so that's yeah, I, I know what you mean. That it could so that sort of longing for the past could so easily be sentimental, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I I didn't I didn't think about it that much really when I was writing. I didn't I didn't try to avoid it or try to. Um, encourage it, really. I mean, luckily, a lot, of my, a lot of the things I wrote about were not very happy memories, so, I mean, some of them, some of them were, you know, sort of happy-ish, but, um, <laughs> but I, didn't, I didn't feel like I had to, um, you know, one usually isn't nostalgic for something that has been painful, right? So, I didn't feel like I had to, to rein that in at all. Um, anyway. It's my best answer. I don't think that the book is completely about painfulness, but whatever. It seems like both of you are dealing with the truth. You know, observation, um, what you learn from observation and looking back at it, but not in a sentimental way, not in that kind of, you know, ooh, you know. <laughs> Interesting. Mm. You know, and Karen, you always save, uh, save us from nostalgia by your wonderful sense of humor. being nostalgic, but almost being the opposite of nostalgic. Okay, and thank you. Tony, that one image of the little yellow bird in, in its ye little yellow, little yellow cage. cage. I love I'll never that. forget it. Thank you. <laughs> Not nostalgic. Yeah. I, lo I love that image, too. Yeah. I think we've got real problems in the world today. I don't think anybody would deny that. And uh, I hope my poems bring those out and uh, Hopefully, people will think more about them. Uh, nostalgic in that sense, maybe. I don't know. Is there a nostalgic side of that? Possibly, but uh, certainly uh, what we're doing to the world today is pretty dreadful. And if we're spending billions of dollars looking for another world, mm, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> heading to Mars. Let's go to Mars. Yeah, so, right. yeah. That's right. I'd like to say thank you again. To, to Tim and to uh, Charles and Cynthia for organizing this. And it's an honor to read this lady. I admired her for a long time. Vice and, versa. And, uh, it's been terrific. So, thank you.